that. Before handing it over to our main speaker, Christian Mercier, I'm going to introduce him. He has been at the uh, CEGEP level for 15 years now. He has started in uh, nat natural sciences, and now he's in the technical uh, area. He uh, is interested in the motivations of students and teachers. He is also interested uh, for a long time in innovative practices for uh, uh, alternative uh, practices uh, for marking and uh, pedagogy. So, Christian, how are you today? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Perfect. Have a great webinar, ladies and gentlemen. I am now handing it over to Christian. So, it is my turn now to share my screen. So, you will see... Um, I can't multitask, so just give me a second here to put up my screen. So you should see my presentation on the full screen. Yes, uh, perfect. So first, thank you uh, for uh, being here with us uh, today on a Thursday a lunchtime. Uh, imagine that in your colleges and organizations, there's not necessarily time off reserved for this. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I uh, had said to myself, maybe in August, it would be interesting to, there's a lot of discussion about alternative marking practices. And I maybe I can add to the discussion to make a presentation with my observations and my comments and uh, further the discussion. So uh, that's uh, when I said I'm going to try and do a webinar ar around this. And uh, there's uh, uh, about 50 or 60 of you today. Uh, uh, thank you for being with us. So I'm going to introduce myself briefly, Christian Mercier. I've been a teacher at CEGEP for 15 years. Uh, what I can say is I teach right now at ETIQ, Agro, uh, uh, Agro e Food Technology Institute at saint Saint. We have another one at La Pocatia. We have two campuses. So we have to also um, distinguish here that uh, there is a CEGEP at saint Saint and a CEGEP at La Pocatia. For us, ETIQ, we are distinct. We we are not affiliated to the other colleges. We teach, uh, give college level programs at the technical uh, level. At the college level, we give technical programs, uh, programs, but we have two different entities. So ETHQ is like ETHQ, we could say, where ETHQ will be uh, in hotel uh, and leisure uh, uh, tourism uh, uh, sciences. And we are uh, in agri-food and agriculture, and we teach programs about uh, agri-business, uh, farming, agro-mechanical, engineering, tractor transmissions, etc., cetera, uh, animal production uh, techniques, horticulture, agri, uh, uh, for example, permaculture, and uh, uh, I'm forgetting some things. So we, uh, or did we do landscaping as well, horticulture, uh, ornamental uh, horticulture as well. What uh, I, I'm concerned with here, what is interesting for me, I work in uh, food processing. So, uh, Technique de la procédure de qualité des aliments, so techniques for processing quality of food, uh, for the quality of food. So uh, what we teach uh, in my department at LITIQ, we teach as a team. The teachers are part of a team per program, and they have to give all the classes of a specific program. So uh, for TPQ uh, classes uh, for lab analysis processes. Uh, rules and regulations around uh, agribusiness and so in 15 years i've uh, taught uh, uh, here since 2018 i was also at andre uh, Lorado before i'm uh, a chemist i have a bachelor's in chemistry and then i was uh, uh, specialized in uh, food chemistry and uh, the master's degree level so if i work at, at the ETIQ, i give classes uh, more at the process level quality control chemical analysis but i also teach uh, mathematics I specialized in managing uh, uh, labor uh, workers, and I also give uh, some uh, baking and uh, classes and uh, bread making, and uh, we want to standardize the process and uh, a large production of bread, and so it, uh, it's really interesting. We touch on a lot of things, and it allows me as a teacher to... Uh, really get my hands in everything and to experience all kinds of different things. And there's one group that we follow that uh, takes uh, many different classes. My tasks uh, 
are uh, uh, sometimes I uh, have to give three different classes and I, uh, I have different uh, strategies to incorporate alternative marking uh, uh, strategies in my classes procedures. So what I want to present today, you know, let's talk about alternative marking procedure. I'm talking about alternative marking processes or procedures. Why is it alternative and what does that mean? So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a recap and uh, talk about a bit of the research around this because these practices are uh, fairly new uh, at the college level, but also in North America, uh, elsewhere uh, in Quebec. So I'll talk about certain strategies and issues around this. So I'm not as great expert or specialist. I'm more of a specialist uh, that uh, uh, in this thing that I learned about this uh, uh, alternative marking strategies and these uh, different pedagogical methods, and I, I have a certain baggage of experience that I want to share with you. So the issues are, um, of, there's a whole range of them. There's four main categories from the student point of view, the teacher point of view for the different departments or uh, teams, and at the organizational level as well. So and you can see here, uh, for example, uh, uh, what we do with corrections and planning uh, classes and marking, and we're going to talk about all of that today. So let's talk about alternative marking uh, processes. These are practices for marking. And so what's interesting to understand is we're talking about marking, not necessarily evaluation, but marks. So evaluation as such can be uh, take multiple forms in different ways. And uh, now we're talking about the mark, the final grade, if you will. So that's why we call it alternative, because we are interested in different trends related to alternative uh, marking strategy. So I have some colleagues that have already written articles uh, in uh, some uh, uh, journals, and I have the references, uh, uh, and you can go read uh, the papers that they wrote. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, demarking or demarking. It's a bit uh, counterintuitive. Why should we give a grade? So we're talking about unmarking or uh, to unmark uh, the work and to really give qualitative uh, and to try to minimize the quantitative evaluation and then try to minimize the work with giving it a, a numerical grade. So it's a bit of a deeper thinking around uh, pedagogical practices and learning, but it's something that could be uh, interesting to explore. And we some authors, Blum, that wrote a book about uh, not giving numerical grades or unmarking. So there's different approaches based on mastery of certain uh, capacities or standards where we will measure progress in terms of specific objectives. So it's with this kind of grading, it, maybe it's easier to import into uh, different uh, pedagogical systems based on skill, uh, 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 mastering certain skills. So as teachers, we have to uh, uh, teach certain skills with certain different elements, certain phases and different objectives uh, for learning these skills. So we're going to talk about marking based on or grading based on the, uh, reaching uh, specific objectives or uh, specific skills. So uh, grading by specification. So instead of focusing on the objective of uh, uh, what we want to teach, we focus more on the process. The uh, work uh, the and people should show their work. A teach a, a student that does the work as given by the teacher and uh, meets uh, the standards and satisfies uh, the objectives uh, for uh, learning in the class. But in the context of specification, a specification is a range of. Uh, elements that we note satisfactory. So uh, when we talk about alternative grading practices, I'm just uh, just to say satisfactory or not. So it's the cumulative of these uh, different tasks in number and in quality that allow us to attest if the student has met the objectives of the class or course. So another one here uh, is uh, uh, by contract, grading by work contract. So we uh, throw up a contract that talks about the number of, uh, of of the work done, but it's not notwithstanding quality. That's the number of work, the amount of work, and so the some people say, well, that's not good. He can just submit anything, and it will count. But you no, know, there are certain eligibility criteria, of course, and uh, that correspond to our expectations to be accepted. Uh, so, but we still 
put the emphasis on we don't want to judge the student's work necessarily directly, but in a case like that, we have a dynamic where we want to uh, uh, have a balance of power between the teacher and student with the <coughs> they work. The teacher, uh, the student has certain habits that make him uh, better and perform better. And uh, and we hope through uh, the process that the work becomes uh, better. So that's an example of all the different marking or grading alter uh, solutions or alternative uh, uh, processes. So there's a lot of other ones here. There's uh, David Clark who writes a blog about alternative grading. It's called an alternative grading glossary. There's a link in the uh, presentation. So it's not really different than what we're already doing at the college level, at the CEGIP level. We already have uh, learning objectives or uh, uh, we uh, are, uh, give work to take home and uh, we have, uh, it's by doing these uh, uh, final projects that we can uh, grade the student. So I want to say that uh, alternative practices of grading or marking, I recommend uh, we all uh, uh, need to attest if the student has reached uh, uh, the uh, skills that we uh, want to uh, teach. So an alternative practice versus a conventional uh, uh, approach. We see a table here with the, both of them, the traditional approach. You already know how to do this. Uh, we will give a grade uh, related to a specific uh, task performance. So it's at a specific time in the semester when we do our courses or course plan, we have our calendar. And in May, let's say, at we're uh, mid-semester uh, now. So there's a, a, will be an exam next Wednesday. So in a traditional approach, we'll say each mistake will be counted negatively. Like each mark will be counted against them. Well, I'm not doing negative uh, correction. A student will be able to uh, write a paper, uh, an essay question, and uh, an answer to an essay question, and with the certain sentences to show his process and his thinking. I give him uh, marks based on that. For example, he gets 8 out of 10 for answering this question. But at the same time, we could ask the question with regards to the student, what is his perception of all of this? Um, as you know, we have students that will look at the mark, the grade, and if they have 80%, one of the first questions they're going to ask is, where did I lose marks? And they will go through and they will really place a lot of emphasis on their mistakes or what they're missing. Traditional approach, uh, the grade at the end of the class is the sum of each of these summative evaluations throughout uh, a, a semester. And uh, with the uh, the weighting of the different methods of evaluation, you end up with a final grade. Alternative approach, however, it's not necessarily the performance at a specific task on a specific day. We will more go through evaluating the performance uh, through a specific period of the time of time, like a semester or part of a semester. So there will be, of course, mistakes will be identified errors and, and, uh, and a feedback that is not graded. So it comes back to the question of ungrading. So within a semester, we will focus on the feedback, positive feedback uh, with uh, uh, no grades. So when I say no grades, can I give a number three, four, four out of four, three out of three? You can do what you want. But the idea is we want to get away from uh, the uh, instinct that the exam is out of 100 and you will take off grades uh, and each mark will be important towards the final grade uh, and the success of the student at the end of the semester. So uh, for alternative practices, the final grade represents a level of mastery at the end of the semester without regard to the mistakes made throughout the process. So because... It, it, uh, can the student uh, perform well in these uh, activities and uh, how are they evaluated? And so I will go right away to the next slide. I'll come back. Uh, uh, so, and clearly this possibility of uh, redoing certain evaluations is one of the fundamental pillars. Uh, so to retake uh, uh, an evaluation. So you can see in this uh, slide, the Clark and Talbert, the four pillars of alternative grading uh, strategies. Uh, so Robert Talbert came and gave a presentation on how he integrates alternative grading practices. He's a math teacher. Very good book. 
uh, it's uh, a book that I happen to have next to me here. And he comes out with these four pillars. So I will start on the right, where we will have reassessment without penalty. Of course, we will have, sorry, I'm jumping a little bit here, but we want standards that are clearly defined, standards that are clearly defined, but also that are uh, in line with the objectives, the educational objectives and the objectives of the class as a whole. And uh, uh, the objectives also that are attainable, that are realistic, that a teacher or a student uh, in a class can reach these objectives, uh, reach certain standards. Standards can be uh, uh, defined also uh, as substandards, and uh, uh, we can go uh, uh, gradually step by step. But the uh, standards we want to reach, the expectations of the teacher are clearly specified. A uh, uh, helpful feedback. It, that feedback has to be related with concrete actions. Uh, to uh, given to the student and uh, the objective of helping uh, them be better students and better learners. And uh, also Marx, uh, numerical or not, throughout the process that indicate uh, progress towards uh, a standard that we want to reach. So it's a bit strange. We are at uh, alternative uh, grading here, but it's important to give a grade in a, in, in a one way or another, because it's a fundamental element where the uh, student uh, will use to measure their progress if uh, they are distinguishing themselves or haven't performed well in certain activities. We can give them feedback through a grade or a comment uh, to this uh, has not been reached. I haven't uh, evaluated this or that aspect yet. Uh, we're going to get there. So it's normal at the beginning of the year. So I want to call your attention to the fundamental principle uh, Cal, uh, that uh, Mr. Talbert was saying, keep it simple. It seems a bit intimidating because I'm coming in with a lot of... Uh, things to think about. How do I grade without grading numerically? And keep it simple. Go it, uh, go at it uh, in your own way and at your own speed. So I'm going to talk about that uh, a bit later on. So why do alternative practices are gaining so much practice? Why uh, attraction? So why are there so many participants? Why are they becoming so popular? Like you may say, we uh, are, we're talking about that since last year and still today, because we have to admit the traditional approach has its drawbacks. It uh, brings forward certain biases through the evaluation process. And for us, unfortunately, when we adhere to the traditional method, we are accomplices to a flawed system that... Uh, brings with it uh, some injustice for certain students. I'll give you an example. So we will, uh, an example that comes from John Feldman, another book I can talk about later on by Feldman, if we have some time. Uh, so a book in which we're in, look at, at two students, Alice and Bob. Uh, Robert Talbert uh, talked about this also in his book, but uh, the example is uh, striking. We have Alice in brown that has not taken the first exam for a reason that we don't really know. Uh, she was sick or absent for some reason, family issues or something, or she was so inconfident or so afraid that she didn't go to the exam. I don't know. But anyway, uh, our policies say an absence, uh, an absence gets a zero. So we give a zero to Alice, and what we see throughout the, the semester, Alice has uh, taken control and has adapted and has done better. At the end of the year, she ends up with uh, a grade of 100 on her final exam. So if we apply the traditional approach, where the final grade uh, is the cumulative of three exams, Alice, in this case, she gets to a grade of 60. And then we have Bob. So you have Bobs in your classes, students that uh, succeed, but uh, really uh, at the limit, at a 60. So they get a, a final grade of 60 and they just pass. There's some 
issues there are two different kinds of students let's talk about bob we get to the end of the semester bob has passed he got 61 he got 59 do we give him the little one percent or sometimes we see this trend well you know do i bump him up or do i just am i just pushing the problem forward by doing that uh kicking the can if you will into the future so that's a positive uh there's a bias there, uh, the positive bias that uh, uh, brings forward the question legitimately. I could have maybe done things differently to clarify Bob's situation. Uh, if he uh, look at it differently, if he meets certain objectives and has uh, learned certain things in the class. Alice, same thing. Uh, we, uh, Alice, same thing. Well, wow, poor her. She just had a bad start, uh, but uh, she ends up with a relatively good grade at the end uh, and a good grade at the final exam. And so if I build my final exam the, the right way to measure the skills and the final objectives of the class, she would uh, merit a much better grade than the 60%. So it has a negative effect, if you will, because she did a, got 100 on the final exam and she still got 60. So uh, Alice should have had a better grade than what we see. And that's one of the issues that we can see with the traditional approach. So I'm sharing my screen here, and I think you can. Sorry, I see some fluctuations on my screen, but I hope you guys know we see things very well. Christian, no problem. That's my computer. OK, work computer. OK, so I uh, will carry on. Thank you. So before we look at the research uh, uh, papers around this, I'm a teacher that uh, is uh, have a lot of gray area. I don't really uh, follow one thing specifically. I don't take a hard line on anything because a traditional approach has certain advantages. Um, so let's be honest. We are in a system of numerical grading that is uh, between two levels, high school and university. And let's talk about the uh, uh, cot air that was created so that we can have a system, a standardized system, uh, the R rating, cot air, to evaluate the performance of our students. For students that, uh, that to have this method uh, is something that is really uh, drilled into them and that they're uh, used to. And for uh, uh, managers and directors uh, uh, and uh, pedagogical uh, administrators, it allows us to uh, classify students with their performance. Uh, so we have to not throw out the baby with the bathwater and, and keep this system regardless. And we don't want to revolutionize to the point where we throw everything out. So do we, should we classify students or are to uh, use this to grade students uh, uh, we can have a debate about that but one other thing this notion of the points a percentage if you will it's fungible it's fungible in the sense that it's a monetary value our students are capable throughout the semester of making this sum and i need 15 marks 15 points to pass so it's really something that is very mathematical that their, their thinking is rigid around that so and having a alternative practice we have to have sensitivity to the fact that our students uh, regardless are used to certain processes and certain ways of thinking so I'm going to go over this uh, quickly, uh, but I'm going to bring up certain uh, important points. Uh, so we uh, at, we say that attrib attributing a grade contributes to learning. That, falsely, we believe that that a mark will or a grade will motivate the student to do better. We uh, believe that falsely, especially for students that are of difficulties. Uh, the uh, grade can be uh, a, a source of demotivation. So for those who uh, I have students who uh, are really working hard and that are interested in, in learning and then I give them good results, they're encouraged and they want to do better. Yes, but probably in a context of uh, extrinsic motivation here. 
where uh, the grade becomes the paycheck. If you're talking about fungibility, like I said before, something fungible, but we don't do it for an intrinsic reason and the objective of improving uh, ourselves. So the non-numerical uh, 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 grading uh, increases interest towards a task, towards a task, the power of feedback. So we see that the interest comes other uh, from the other than grading, other than numerical grading. So what corroborates that is that it's pretty difficult to evaluate if alternative grading improves the success rate of a class or a program. There are certain studies that uh, are out now where we see that if it doesn't improve success in a class specifically in the first semester when we start in the fall, there are indicators that bring us to believe that students succeed better the, in the next classes, uh, uh, even if they're uh, evaluated with the traditional approach. So we, uh, in our evaluating practices and our grading practices, alternative practices, we give tools to the student that improves their uh, personal growth, their skill level. They have better tools to uh, cope uh, with stress and uh, better learning strategies than just a numerical grade. At ETAC, we are often in engagement mode. And when we talk about engagement, I'm going to talk about the engagement being the manifest, ultimate manifestation of something that may be an internal motivation. I'm going to talk about a motivation that is with the theory of self-determination. So for somebody to be motivated uh, intrinsically, internally, it's motivated from uh, inside. So a good comparison is uh, external motivation is when we train at the gym to have a good body. We want the six pack and uh, the guys at Sejep, they want the six pack, the hard body. And uh, uh, we want to go down to the beach and have a bikini bod. Uh, so uh, so we train for others to for to be perceived in a certain way by others extrinsic motivation intrinsic motivation would be exactly the same thing we go to the gym we train because we want to be healthy we want to be stronger we want to have a better quality of life and live longer so it's a bit of, of an intrinsic motivation so uh, intrinsic motivation uh, the three fundamental reasons the desire for uh, autonomy competency and uh, a good relationship so that uh, alternative uh, uh, practices uh, really touch on three of those things. Uh, autonomy. Evaluation is not done on a specific day. It's throughout a process that uh, covers uh, weeks or uh, months, so the student can choose when they want to uh, exert effort and uh, do the work and can take time on the weekends or uh, evenings. or uh, So uh, the skill competency development that is not uh, numerically graded, but more around uh, feedback around the work that's been done and it contributes to giving the student a feeling of comfort in their skill level. They can observe their personal progression instead of comparing to others numerically with an average. Because if you look at uh, 75, I got 75. What's the average of the group? 70, I'm above the average. Great. No, but now we're really tasked more on the, around the student and what they're, they're doing and how their situation is evolving and changing. So the other one, the last one, is a lot about relationships, a lot around empathy. The teacher doesn't uh, only talk about mistakes. He is really more of a mentor in helping the progress of the student. So, and that really changes the uh, relationship, changes the practice uh, of teaching. So when we uh, teach and we give an exam and we uh, take off grades because of uh, mistakes, as a teacher, we want to justify why we're taking off marks. Alternative methods will put that aside and saying, you've done well, but you should be careful here and here. You made a mistake on the decimal point here, a mistake on your calculations here. You've done well, but you have to improve these. This is more of a relational aspect to teaching. Christian, I have two questions. One from your colleague, Julien Martineau, that asks, hello, Christian, in your opinion, using uh, alternative grading uh, practices, can it be an approach that is more relevant with generative AI? Because at the uh, AI uh, era that we are in now, if you use alternative grading, if the 
students really want to develop their skills and really work on developing skills instead of working for a grade and instead will it, this encourage them less to use the more to use the ai to develop instead of just getting a grade yes i understand the question yes uh, julien always talks about ai but i'm just going to say one thing there's other articles that i haven't mentioned here we really tend to believe that where is plagiarism in all of this and so chat gpt some of the people use them to write essays and then take it and hand it in to the teacher. But often what we see is, sorry, I dropped something. I'm sorry, I was coughing. I uh, uh, didn't shut off my mic. Okay, we noticed that uh, when you uh, take away the numerical grade as a means of communication between the student and the teacher, the student makes more effort and uh, tries to work harder in uh, their uh, uh projects or work so that it has a less of a tendency to go for plagiarism so i could talk about this in another webinar but is there uh should we accompany them through ai or should we ban them from using it i want to accompany them and using ai so everything around plagiarism uh with the indicators that uh show that it goes down because we favorize building skills and the work and the process uh, independently of the numerical result at the end thank you Cynthia Gagnon, who is asking, when we publish the grades on Omnivox, would it be better to hide the group average uh, if you want to follow alternative practices, that is? Yes and no. In the context of alternative grading practices, it depends if you want to hide the group average or not. I use an approach that is uh, pass or fail. So um, in the grades, I can give 100% or zero. And the average will be uh, pass or fail, but uh, it's something that uh, the student can easily situate themselves because it's a, a pass or fail. If it's 60, it uh, doesn't represent it as much, but uh, if I can talk about a traditional approach, whereas in this case, there are anxiety factors when uh, we publish the average of the group of the because it's a natural reflex. And uh, for us as teachers, if we were graded uh, uh, numerically, we would also want to compare ourselves with the average of other teachers. So there's an anxiety effect there associated uh, with publishing the group average. But am I saying since yet not to do it, to hide the group average? No, because the teachers are already in a system where they expect to know what the group average is. And probably in a teacher-student relationship, there's a certain level of accompaniment to uh, that uh, 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 goes with this, especially if you look at uh, alternative grading. And so there's an accompaniment that we have to uh, frame all of this and make sure it's well understood at the beginning and give some context around what does your grade mean and how should you look at it within the context of this course with uh, alternative grading methods, for example. So I don't know if that answers your question, but both uh, uh, solutions are possible depending on your context. So uh, shall I carry on? Yes, uh, Christian, please go ahead. Don't hesitate if there are any questions. Uh, so problems and strategies. So four uh, main pillars, four axes, uh, students. One of the uh, issues, it's not just in my class uh, at the PQR, but it's based on this is my example here, but it comes from colleagues as well, or colleagues of colleagues, and I uh, want to uh, make this a bit anonymous, but uh, except for the first issue here, because when I talk about food chemistry, TPQR, it's uh, 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 in my classes. So we are in the fall semester. We have a cursus. Of a, we're going to do alternative grading and uh, that uh, uh, takes many forms. In my case, I come in with the food chemistry class. It's a first uh, semester. Uh, they come from high school or adult education. And um, so what I did is part of the class, when I say keep it simple, one important element is you don't need to change everything from A to Z. As in all innovation, start small. 
so small well it's still 40 percent, about half but these are uh, practical activities or uh, in my class where uh, physical activities where I separate them in different labs, uh, different uh, labs to pick up a certain specific skill. So we are teaching them processes, scientific processes that can uh, be reproduced. So I apply that as a specific, as being a certain skill, an approach based on following certain standards and uh, educational objectives. We talk about lab skills or lab capacities. So I, uh, separate them to seven different skills. The different skills are also separated in different sub-objectives, separate standards. But as you can see here, for some students that already are beginning in CEGEP, they have to learn uh, about scheduling and office hours of the teacher and I am uh, responsible for my own learning and I do my homework when I want. And now there's also alternative practices with this teacher. And some of these students are blocked. They're uh, almost there, but they don't quite get it. Even if we give them a possibility of uh, retaking an exam without penalty or redoing the work without penalty, we end up in a dead end. So how do we see that uh, on the ground? The uh, skill number seven, be able to consign measurements and res results in a uh, lab book. So to be able to fill out a lab book and uh, uh, we want a signature, we want everything done systematically, we are teaching them a skill of teach, keeping a lab book, a book of results for traceability in the lab. So in the sub objectives here, there are two that are not reached. So writing uh, uh, measurements in a table in, in compliance with the guide, we want a title, we want the uh, information to be clear and on certain factors represent correctly. We want correct calculations when, and we take lab measurements, measures in the lab and we have certain calculations of concentrations, for example, and the calculations have to be shown in these tables. So for certain students, uh, they can do that. They do it signing at the end, but they are they get stuck. And when uh, you say they're almost there, they're stuck. Uh, so I can't, uh, uh, these skills, I don't give a mark, it's pass fail. So in, uh, it would be a, to a grade of zero, uh, the, uh, so uh, acquiring the skill is 100 and uh, the learning process zero. So the whole waiting uh, uh, around that. So I uh, have to uh, retake it or, uh, or almost there, but it needs to be redone. You need to do certain things uh, to get your grade. So you have to, it causes a lot of anxiety for certain students because they adapt, uh, they're adapting to the college level and we see that they get stuck. So uh, some strategies, quickly, short term, you're in class, you tried such things and you have students that are stuck, their wheels are turning, they're spinning their wheels. And are, are these students making progress? Because for us, uh, uh, in a degraded or demarked uh, uh, process, the teacher, uh, the student doesn't always see that his zero for lab one, zero for lab four, there's an improvement, even though they both got zero. So if he's making progress, it's important throughout written feedback in the lab book or where I uh, have this evaluation table. I have to say to the student, yes, you've improved on this or that. Now you have to improve these two little things so that you can uh, satisfy the objective. So there's some students who uh, they, they are counting on certain uh, a bit of luck for us. I have certain labs in the uh, semester and we uh, ask to make a table. If it's not done for label for lab two, there's a third one, there's a fourth one. You can improve and uh, you can catch up. So there's different lab exercises. And so uh, they are waiting for maybe the easier one. And so it's maybe not a good strategy. We have students that are satisfied with partial grades by Bob at 60%, for example, uh, you have to be able to give them a bit of a better guidance to say, you have to do more than the minimum. I expect more from you and I wanted you to do more. So the uh, uh, feedback, verbal feedback is very important. You just want to check boxes. Uh, uh, I, it's more than that. There's a lot of students that where the feedback is important. It's not just checking boxes, but a comment. Give them something verbal or written, something they can go on uh, around improving uh, themselves and uh, 
until they reach the objective. So celebrate each little victory, celebrate each accomplishment. If there's accomplished something new or something uh, uh, they've improved, it's important to notice that and, and tell them that. So when uh, they get good results, they focus more on the negative, uh, if it's successful or not. If they have success, yes, I can check this box and uh, we can move forward, but they don't take the time to celebrate and uh, appreciate uh, their progress and each of their little victories. So, Kisya, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. It's very interesting what you're saying, but now you're on slide number 13, and I see that there's 31, and we have 15 minutes left. Wow, Nicole. Okay. So, and I have a long question for you as well. So, I'm going to go quickly. So keep in mind also as a teacher that your criteria doesn't need to be perfect. So when I say satisfactory, it's normal that a student uh, uh, isn't perfect at everything. They may be uh, forgetting certain small things, but we are well aware that despite that, the student has a good global understanding and uh, reaching certain skills or capacities. So less uh, Excel tables, more empathy. That's very important uh, in building a positive relationship with the students. So very quickly, um, the notion of uh, satisfactory criteria, pass fail, this is not new. In 2004, we had a certain algorithm that was proposed uh, in uh, the teachers of mathematics, uh, the national review. We had uh, meets expectations. If yes, the black line in the middle, we consider it's a passing grade. It's satisfactory, I should say. And if it's non satisfactory, sometimes uh, through a retake or a revision. Uh, so, issue number two. We will be honest. It's important to do, give feedback to allow people to retake exams uh, or retake, uh, 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 redo an exercise. It's a lot of correction. It's a lot of extra work. An issue that uh, comes from one of my colleagues that teaches uh, at college uh, English, and I, uh, she says I have an impression, uh, the impression that I'm always correcting. So and this is a portfolio, 25%. Uh, alternative grading practices is based on certain objectives and uh, uh, as formulated here, writing uh, a, an essay, uh, having a clear uh, message, uh, an oral presentation. The uh, teacher has 63 students in this case, and so it can be more than that for some of you if you count all your students. Some of them uh, have 80 or 100 students. And so retaking and redoing work means that the, I have to correct it again. So the student has to uh, give a second oral presentation. So it's an avalanche of correction and work uh, at the end of the semester. So for those who are interested in grades by specification, it's a list of work. Uh, this is the example that you see here, where you have a list of uh, three exercises uh, so to satisfy the objective, writing an essay and all the instructions around that. So we're more around uh, an idea of doing the work to meet the objective. So we're talking about a grading system by specifications. So by meeting specifications. So there's a question from Eric Gagnon, who's a, phil a philosophy teacher. He talks about this. Uh, as he said, I have uh, give feedback on essays. I have 120 students, 160 in Philo 2 and Philo Philosophy 3. So writing that much becomes tiring. Do you have any advice to uh, avoid uh, writing uh, feedback uh, 120 times per uh, uh, assignment? It's a lot of work. It's tiring to give written feedback to that many students. Start small. So for alternative grading strategies, so we maybe will do one dissertation, one uh, essay, uh, maybe something small, uh, the simple outline to try certain things, to try uh, different strategies for grading. So do we need every time a new essay or to uh, uh, redo, uh, rework the first essay? So in the context of uh, great uh, and long essays, like in philosophy, maybe it's not worth writing a new one. Maybe you should just keep reworking the same one three or four times. So it's a, a project for a semester. Uh, with a team, instead of giving three or four 
projects just to revise the same big project and uh, follow them through the process and uh, uh, before even the revision is done uh, giving uh, uh, given back to the teacher preparing these students to review or, or change yes you can correct essays uh, with certain comments and notes uh, given by the teacher but giving a group feedback and so they can but he's proposing to avoid this fatigue due to over correction and over commenting he, uh, he uses a qualitative table that defines predefines if the skill is reached uh, or not uh, with what elements you're looking at and and so a an evaluation table a qualitative evaluation table that is definitive that is def de defined so for example can we um do a self evaluation an evaluation by peers before uh, uh and again, the work, so there's a checklist uh, if uh, uh, with the objectives of the teacher, uh, I have given two arguments, one counter argument. And so this uh, work before handing in the essay will avoid certain frustrations on the student uh, uh, and the team for having worked hard on something that is not satisfactory. So preparing the students to hand in their work or uh, make changes. Uh, yes, it takes time. But uh, the 20, 30 minutes to review everything before we hand it in uh, will reduce uh, correction uh, time. So to use tokens, uh, um, sometimes we have a lot of uh, tasks to accomplish, work to do with a uh, specification uh, strategy. So we uh, ask a student to make choices. I'm going to use one of my chips and do only three, sir. So three instead of four, we still have a good idea of if they've reached the objectives or skills. Uh, it allows the student to make certain choices and it uh, it really helps them develop their competence and their confidence. And uh, we have uh, one copy less to correct and it's something very interesting. So you give them this chip that they can exchange, an option. So. Uh, uh, so the, on the usage of tokens, uh, in, uh, so that's very important. The other one is uh, a uh, framework that is strict and equitable for everybody. We uh, ask for certain flexibility. We want to be able to redo uh, certain exams or uh, essays, but there's a rigid structure around the flex or under underpinning the flexibility. It has to be uh, the deadline is the third week, and it's very important. The deadline is very important. It is part of the work uh, that the student will do that the, the, the that we'll have to deal with after uh, on the uh, in the uh, world of work as well. So maybe I could give grades even if they had it in late so that's a very bad idea to encourage people to hand in things late so yes planning 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 plan uh, your semester maybe there's a week of spring break uh, maybe give homework just before the spring break it gives uh, uh, maybe you'll have a lot of corrections to do after but it gives you a more latitude and uh, uh, better efficiency in your correction. You don't have to defend point by point each of the elements. And so it makes it so that at work, instead of spending 15 minutes, we have a good appreciation. Yes, I'm sorry, I talk a lot, Nicole. So issue number three, I want to innovate, but there's three teachers giving this class. So three teachers in a department that has eight teachers. So a teacher goes to OQPC, I want to do alternative uh, grading practice. How do I convince my colleagues? How do I do that? I was explaining and giving a teach, uh, classes on teaching, uh, uh, teaching classes on uh, uh, management, team management and organizational management. So I'm talking about organizational change. So we have to talk about alternative practices. Uh, it's an important change. It's a multifaceted change and aspect uh, the different aspects and so it uh, asks people to change the way of working so we have to uh, really have a good alignment uh, here so external alignment uh, classes uh, budgets everything but internal alignments of objectives as well uh, alignment of fundamental values of people who give the class so for a change to be lasting it has to respect these two alignments internal and external so i'm explaining uh, quickly here 
what I suggest, uh, external alignment, why do we want alternative practices? Well, we're talking about a problem, a problem that is a common one. Often in philosophy, for example, the students are lacking engagement. They'll talk about Plato and Socrates, but uh, with disdain and detachment, and they just throw things at us and without real engagement in the uh, teaching and the learning. So that's a problem that philosophy te uh, teachers can have. So internally, we have to understand that there are different objectives of the department. We want to maybe develop a more ethical uh, learning, more inclusive. And so we want to, to form citizens that are informed and are capable of critical thinking. We want them to be able to speak eloquently. And so that's one of the things also is, is uh, one of the values of our department is, is uh, seniority. And so when we develop a new pedagogical practice, we take, uh, take a, have an edge on a certain class and you know, you know, you converted this into alternative strategy. You're going to teach it the semester after and the semester after. And there's certain uh, teachers that will worry about their colleagues taking control of certain classes. So when there's a change in alternative grading, it's not one teacher, but it's a group of teachers. It's a department. So we do it together. The eight philosophy teachers should be involved in including these alternative practices in their classes. Of course, uh, uh, small implementations and making adjustments as we go. Start small once again. So let's talk about the last issue. The I want to talk about uh, uh, alternative practices, but uh, the uh, teachers association doesn't allow me to do that. So it's a policy in uh, college institutions. And so so it uh, uh, seeks to define the framework for evaluation, but there's always uh, a marks for the final grade. For example, a PEA that is not ETAC, but comes from somewhere else, we have to have a minimal grade of 40%. So this uh, uh, final uh, uh, work must be worth 40% of the grade. So the final uh, uh, essay or test must be worth 40%. So you have alternative methods, for example, up until the final exam, which must be uh, at the in the week of the final exam, the last week of the course, 40% of the final grade can be uh, quite an obstacle. So at the AO, what do they want to do? They want to have equitable evaluation, a respectful and ethical approach, and that attest uh, uh, reaching certain skills at the end of a class or certain objectives. So when we uh, want to have this kind of innovation, it's normal that a guidance counselor or a director or manager uh, or a department head will be uh, uh, opposed to certain changes or opposed to certain ways of doing things. Nobody is against innovation specifically, but sometimes they are afraid of losing control of certain things or losing certain routines or certain ways of doing things and they don't want to change them. So sometimes it's important to communicate uh, from the student's point of view and feedback, but also at the institutional level, there's a risk in adopting alternative practices. Uh, satis uh, if pass fail, is it as rigorous? Why is it satisfactory? Why is it pass? Why is it fail? What are the criteria? So it's like building an evaluation table. How are you going to weigh or uh, have a, a weighting of uh, uh, the uh, uh, grades? And so uh, is a grade of zero, uh, is, does this still, can you still have improvement and so feedback related to that and to uh, with regards to the grade and how we're going to see improvement in the class? And so uh, it's, Student that gets zeros in the first weeks is a source of anxiety, of course, and there has to be a way to accompany them through that. And so at the end uh, of all of the work and the uh, uh, reaching certain specifications, does it uh, show that they've reached certain objectives? And so I have to really think about that. I have the discussions at the organizational level. So I would say that every time I've used alternative practices, for grading, I've always maintained the final evaluation. I keep it simple. I accompany them through the class, but there's still an, uh, a traditional part. And so it's uh, through the process and experience and uh, through observation. So alternative uh, practices, yes or no? So I would invite you very strongly to try because it's a pedagogical initiative that changes uh, the calculus, the relationship between students and teachers. It's more around empathy. It increases motivation, increases uh, engagement. We really have uh, an impression that we're grading and it really counts. And the grade 
uh, really uh, the grading system really looks at the skills they've acquired. We're not there for punishing them because they forgot something, even if it's uh, futile to have missed something. We it, it changes the relation between the grading and the institution. It's important also to clarify these different elements, as I was explaining, how to define performance, if it's pass, fail, the accumulation of a lot of the different uh, uh, work that has to be done by the student. So if you want to learn more, these are the books that I recommend. You can uh, uh, read them on your own time and learn. Grading for equity is not necessarily related with alternative grading practices, but more the grading process itself and equity through grading. So it's for experienced teachers to see. Uh, it's really a great experience because it questions a lot of practices that we take for granted because there's a uh, built into the system. I could also uh, talk about a community of practice around uh, alternative grading practices. Uh, one of my colleagues at Cégep, André Lorando, I would invite you, Caroline uh, Cormier, I um, uh, invite you to send her an email and, par and participate because it's really a, a community of practice and you can really see concretely what they're doing and so uh, on around alternative grading strategies or practices. So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I went on uh, at length, but there was a lot of interesting information. Thank you. I think I have a question, Cynthia gagnon Wellet, for micro grading with a uh, graduated waiting, can it be considered as a uh, alternative grading system? A very uh, one percent, two percent test micro evaluations. Yes, one percent, two percent of the final grade. Um, well, sometimes when we do a one percent, two percent for the final grade, the it doesn't really count that much. Is the student motivated? It's a very monetary fungible aspect of it to uh, uh, the time invested versus the reward. So the alternative grading will uh, try to discourage this kind of thinking and reinforce the relevance of the work. You're doing the work because you want to learn, you want to improve, you want to reach certain skill level. So yes, alternative systems doesn't have to be a huge objective that covers all the aspects of lab practices, for example, but it could be uh, specific tools. I would tend to say Yes, but once again, you have to uh, understand the context and put it in the, the right context and say that the task task is small, so it's uh, a uh, doesn't count for much at the final grade. But that's what you, you have this sub objectives and I have this uh, objective and main objectives and all these micro objectives that fall underneath it. So the sum of all these micro objectives. Uh, uh, adds up to more a global specification. So yes, it can be considered a form of alternative grading practices. Very enriching, uh, thank you. And I uh, want to say, yes, I forgot to, to translate French to English for the, uh, uh, in the evaluation form. So I want to thank you. We, uh, uh, Thank all the participants and all the feedback that you uh, have given us and uh, the chat. You'll see, Christian, there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, that people have shared in the chat. So thank you, everybody. We will see you soon, maybe next week uh, for uh, some of you, where we will talk about uh, virtual care uh, using AI. So thank you. And uh, Christian, I'm going to stick around and... Uh, I uh, imagine that people uh, would like to thank you and maybe uh, uh, ask some, and I'm going to send you the contents of the chat as well. So uh, thank you. And people uh, can uh, use the uh, slide deck uh, that you will share with them. Yes, I'm sorry, I went over a little bit, but it was an hour, but we don't want to go over 60 minutes so as to allow uh, teachers to get back to uh, their class or go to lunch uh, before uh, the afternoon. So thank you. And uh, we will see you soon, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.